Hello, this is Stuart and Lena from Drone Film Guide, the channel where we learn to fly like filmmakers. Compared with videos, taking photos is really straightforward once you've learned the basics. The challenge, however, is having only one frame in which to capture your scene and tell your story. With that in mind, here's our guide to drone photography. Despite the fact that our camera can now fly, generally speaking, the same compositional rules apply. Look for focal points like these amazing hilltop castles, football pitch or hot air balloon. Identify leading lines to draw your viewer's eye through the composition, adding depth and three-dimensionality to the image. Use symmetry to add structure to abstract bird's eye perspectives. Identify repetition in seemingly uninteresting subject matter to engage the viewer's curiosity. Use rule of thirds to guide you where to place elements in your composition. Shoot subjects to help give your scene a sense of scale and help tell your story and take advantage of the unique perspectives afforded by your flying camera. Point it straight down for dramatic results and take photos from previously inaccessible locations. Settings don't make you a good photographer, it's just something you need to get right. So we'll run through this super quickly and then get back on with the more creative aspects. Jumping into the app here, if we bring up the options here, we have the option of auto exposure, aperture priority, shutter priority or manual. Now I think they've given us a few too many options in all honesty. I think the best idea is just to shoot on manual, it's very simple. Keep your ISO down at 100 for minimum noise. Aperture, if you have the option of a changeable aperture, it doesn't really matter too much when you're shooting wide angle landscapes in all honesty. Keep it somewhere four, I don't know, four all the way up to seven for optimal quality. It doesn't really matter. There's no shallow depth of field to be gained here with these kind of drones. As for shutter speed, you want to freeze the action, so anything above one hundredth of a second should do that. As you can see in this dark garage, it's a bit too dark for that, but outside you will have absolutely no problem with a one hundredth or above second of a shutter. If we look at the rest of the photo options, here you can see we have the option of single shot, HDR and all the various kind of smart capture creative shooting modes. We'll get into some of those in a bit. Image size, you want to keep it on 3x2 for maximum resolution, take full advantage of the sensor, you don't want it cropping in for a video format. As for the difference between JPEG and RAW, yes you'll have heard that shooting RAW is beneficial, there's more colour depth, it's easier to manipulate the colours in post and for that reason we shoot RAW. But then we have the paid for software Lightroom that allows us to do that. If you're not at that stage please just shoot JPEG and then build up to RAW. The file sizes are much larger, you need a better computer etc etc. There's nothing wrong with shooting JPEG and then moving on to RAW. If you're shooting raw, white balance, style and colour don't matter because that detail is not captured in the file, but I would recommend leaving your white balance at something fixed at least because at the end of the day when you're going through your files you want to see a constant white balance rather than have the camera change it during your various shots. If you're shooting JPEG, pick the settings that best suit your desired outcome. Okay, jumping across to the final page of settings, the only thing I need to mention here is make sure that your histogram is switched on. The histogram is essential for getting some kind of objective sense of exposure when you're out in the field. Your screen brightness, reflections on the screen, your own eyesight will all have a role to play in how you perceive exposure. You need an objective measure, so leave that histogram switched on. Final point on all of this, just use the autofocus. The autofocus is very good. We haven't found a need to use manual focus when taking photos. Autofocus is great. All that being said, since we've got it up there, why don't we just take a photo of ourselves right now. I'm going to tap focus there. Smile for the camera, Alina. Right, let's get on with the more interesting elements of photography. We interrupt this broadcast to bring it to your attention that today's video is brought to you by... Drone Film Guide. Yes, yes, Drone Film Guide, Alina. <laughs> 
Check out our Drone Cinematography Masterclass. Today we're talking about photography, but we have an eight-hour Drone Cinematography Masterclass. Link in the description below with a discount code embedded. Check it out. Your drone's lens is already pretty wide, but by taking multiple photos and stitching them together, you can create some amazing perspectives. By all means, use the DJI GO app to stitch your photos together, but we would recommend you keep the original photos so you have the option of working on the panorama in post-production as well. The original Mavic Pro was the only drone that let you take portrait photos, so don't forget if you have a different drone that you can take vertical panoramas also. If you go into the photo options here, and if we scroll down to AEB, it's Auto Exposure Bracketing, an HDR photo is a composite of three, or in this case maybe five, identical photos with different exposures. Now this is where it gets a little bit confusing because if you choose the AEB mode, you need to take those three photos or five photos manually into Lightroom and create a composite photo there. If on the other hand you want the DJI GO app to do it for you, you need to go all the way up here to HDR and it will do it for you. But in our experience, the results can be a little bit hit or miss and certainly the colors can be very vibrant and not very uh, subtly or arguably tastefully done. So if you have access to Lightroom or other software that does this, go down to AEB and do three or five exposures of the same scene and then bring them all together in post. Because this technique allows you to capture artificially high levels of dynamic range, you need to be careful not to push it too far. Less is definitely more with this technique. You need to see the image before you see the effect. If you see the effect before you see the image, then you've pushed it too far. Use ND filters to achieve a slow shutter speed that blurs moving elements in your composition, such as this waterfall. Shot with a one-fifth of a second shutter and in D64. Technically one-fifth of a second is not a particularly slow shutter, so you need a really fast-moving object, for example, running water, to be blurred in your image. Mindful also that you're flying a drone and the drone will have little movements, so at one-fifth of a second we found that about 50% of the shots had too much blur to be usable, but it was quite a windy day so you'd do better in cam conditions. I really want to get back up north actually and do this shot again with you instead, that will be a lot better and a lot easier. You can also get an ND1000 for some really slow shutter speed effects, but that's a subject for another video. Polarizers are a fantastic way of reducing glare on reflective surfaces like water, they reduce atmospheric haze in big landscape shots so you get more contrasty and saturated images. So for that reason, every landscape photographer will have a polarizer in his or her... Toolkit. Toolkit, exactly in their photography bag. With drones it's a little bit different because the drone is up in the air not sat on a tripod. So the idea is that you put the polarizer to your eye, this rotates and you can pick the amount of polarization that you want, stick it on your drone and go up and take your photo. Now that works perfectly if you're doing very very deliberate planned shoots. You've considered where the sun is relative to your polarizer because that influences the amount of polarization and then you're good to go. It would be disingenuous, however, to say stick a polarizer on and your photos will be better. That's just not how it works. So anyway, keep them in mind and give them a shot. I would love to hear your thoughts on polarizers and if you have any examples of where you've used a polarizer to really enhance your footage or your photography. The difference between an amazing shot and an average shot will often be the light. Landscape photographers camp for hours and days to get a perfectly lit shot. Low evening sun, for example, creates shadows, and shadows create depth, and depth makes your 2D representation of the world look more three-dimensional, which is good. That being said, don't let imperfect lighting conditions stop you from going out and taking photos. Get out there and practice. Over time, however, once you've figured out the perfect composition for your 
particular setting. Maybe wait for those perfect conditions. Keep an eye on the weather forecast. Get back out there and take that perfect photo. So if you're shooting 4K video with your drone, keep in mind that every frame of that video is an 8 megapixel photo. And if you are using ND filters to reduce your shutter speed to 1 50th of a second, then watch out for the motion blur. But other than that, I think taking stills from the video is a great way of killing two birds with one stone. We're going to come back to some of those topics in more detail in future, so stay tuned for those. I think since we're talking about photography, it would be remiss of us to not mention our Instagram. Instagram. Yes, go check out our Instagram. We have photos on Instagram <laughs> <laughs> and some different content that doesn't necessarily make its way onto YouTube. So do follow us along on that. Uh, right, I think we're done. Until next time, happy, happy flying. flying.